Hi, I'm Scott with BibleStudying.net, and we're continuing to talk about the history of the church and some changes to some important aspects of Christian theology that took place in the 4th century. Uh, specifically, we've been talking about the, the concept of the gospel and the, and the kingdom. Uh, we talked about this in our study on the gospel, and what we're seeing is that the early church had one view. Uh, the apostolic church had a view that, of an earthly coming kingdom. The, the Neoplatonists and the Gnostics had a view that, no, we weren't going to live on earth. Salvation meant escaping from the world that we live in, the material world, to, uh, to a heavenly existence. And then men like Augustine and Origen uh, helped and were influential at getting the church in the 4th century to adopt the concept of uh, a heavenly salvation rather than the earthly salvation concept, an earthly kingdom that the church had held for two or 300 years since the time of the apostles. And so as we talk about that, uh, we, we began to talk about the idea of the church and the state and how, how, how the church views its relationship to the state and the governments around us and how that might have changed. Um, and so there was a particular change that did take place in the 4th century, again, on this issue. Uh, and so the historical setting is that Constantine is, is the emperor of, of the entire Roman Empire at this point. And uh, he converts or professes, professes that he's converted from, to Christianity. He recognizes Christianity, makes it the official religion of the state. And now we have this weird situation where the emperor is supposed to be a Christian and the state is supposed to be a Christian state. What did Christians, what does the church do with that, and how did that, how did that situation uh, differ from the earlier church's view? And so um, in order to get the church to participate in the Roman society, which is what was beginning to happen there at the time of Constantine, you had to do a couple of things to an er the earlier church view, which we'll get to in a second. One, you had to remove the expectation of an earthly coming kingdom, because if you're waiting for the Messiah to get back before you can have an earthly kingdom, then the idea of an earthly kingdom without the Messiah here uh, is, is strange to Christians, and it doesn't work. So they, the, at this time of Constantine, we had to work, the teachers, uh, the leaders at this point, had to work towards creating or giving the church the idea that you could have a Christian state without Jesus here. Uh, you could have uh, a Christian state without Jesus here. And then so you had to undo earlier Christian points of view uh, that the Christians were not to participate in the state until the Messiah came back. And so we'll talk about how these changes uh, took place. So we'll, let's start with biblical teaching, and we'll talk about what some biblical teaching is, and then we'll talk about how the early church understood that biblical teaching. And again, not to say that their interpretation was necessarily correct, um, but we're going to just talk about how the early church took this and then how the church of the 4th century and since the 4th century has taken these teachings. So, before his death, Jesus explains to Pilate that his kingdom was not now of this world. That's John 18, 36. In Acts 1, after his resurrection, the apostles ex still expect some sort of earthly messianic kingdom, ask if Jesus is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. That's Acts 1, 6. Um, instead of restoring the kingdom at that point, Jesus ascends to heaven, and the apostles are told by two angels that as Jesus ascended uh, into heaven, one day he would return and come back. That's Acts 1, 9 through 11. Uh, Peter seems to understand this, and in Acts uh, 3, 19 through 26, he explains to the crowd that Jesus is going to remain in heaven until the times of restoration occur. So that seems to be a relationship to the idea of the, until Jesus is going to remain in heaven until the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. So there won't be a intervening kingdom of, of God's people until Jesus returns, essentially, is what Peter seems to be saying. In Acts 2, uh, I'm sorry, in Philippians 3.20, Paul states that our citizenship is with Christ in heaven as we await for Christ to return, uh, presumably bringing that kingdom with him. Uh, in, in Revelation 19.11-20, uh, verse 4, uh, we have the description of Jesus' return, the destruction of the wicked, and the reign of Christ and his saints on the earth. Uh, in the middle of all of these passages, we have Romans, in which in Romans 12, 17 through 13, 7, Paul explains that in this age, um, the job of dispensing justice, that's the Greek word there, um, we see it in English as vengeance, but it's civil justice, legal justice, um, that job has been appointed in this age to the state. Uh, according to Paul in Romans 12, 19, Christians are not to carry out justice or vengeance. Again, that's legal justice, it's not personal vendetta. Uh, and he says that that job, carrying out justice, is something the state does, not the Christians. Um, at least these are how the uh, apostolic church of the first couple hundred, 
uh, years took these things, they saw uh, Jesus, uh, the separation of the church from the state in statements like uh, Paul's statement that those who bear the sword, that the bearing of the sword is the state's job. And they also saw through Jesus' commands in the, in the Gospels that we should be harmless as doves, that we should turn the other cheek, that we should put away the sword, and that we shouldn't fight because his kingdom is not of this world. Um, uh, those are from Matthew 10, 16, uh, Matthew 5, uh, Matthew 26, John 18. And so the early church took all of these statements and said, oh, we must not, apparently we're not going to be part of the civil governments and the states of this world until Jesus comes back. That was their conclusion. And so let's take a look at that from some of these writings. This is from uh, Mathietes. He says, for the Christians, uh, they dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners, as citizens, they share in all things with the others, and yet they endure all these things as if they were foreigners. They pass their days on earth. Uh, he says, every land is to them as their native country, and every land of their birth as the land of strangers. So um, they pass their days on earth, he says, but uh, we'll go on. So the next quote here is from Justin. He says, um, for from Jerusalem there went out into the world men twelve in number. They proclaimed to every race of men that they were sent by Jesus Christ to teach the word, and we who formerly used to murder one another do not only now refrain from making war upon our enemies, but he says we're willing to die for Christ. So they refer, they refuse to make war, uh, the Gentiles did, as a result of receiving the gospel. This again, this next quote is from Justin. He says, the Gentiles um, who would repent of the evil which they had, had gone when they heard the doctrine taught by the apostles, neither shall they learn war anymore. And he's, in, he's interpreting... Uh, Old Testament prophecies there and applying them to the church. This is from Tertullian. He says, We must first inquire whether it is proper, whether warfare is proper at all for Christians. Okay, of course, he's writing about 200 before Constantine and, and Augustine and, and all the changes that were taking place. He says, Do we believe it is lawful for human oath to be super added to a divine one? For one man to come under promise to another master after Christ, shall it be held lawful to make peace, uh, to make occupation of the sword that is military service? When the Lord proclaims that those who use the sword will perish by the sword, and shall the Son of Peace take part in battle when it does not become him even to sue at law, quoting from the New Testament where Paul's saying, don't go suing each other. Um, and he says, who, we are not the avenger of our own wrongs. So how can we be involved in, religion, in political civil justice if we can't even avenge ourselves, according to Paul? And there he's quoting from Romans. Uh, and then he says, when a man has come a believe, become a believer and faith has been sealed, there must be either an immediate abandonment of it, that is military service, or, uh, which has been the course with many. Touching this primary aspect of the question as to the lawfulness of a military life itself, I will not add more. I banish from us the military life. He says, the inquiry is made. Um, as whether a believer may enter into military service. The question is also asked whether those in military service may be admitted to the faith. A man cannot give his allegiance to two masters, God and Caesar. How will a Christian man participate in war? In fact, how will he serve even in peace without a sword? For the Lord has taken the sword away. Nevertheless, the Lord afterward, in disarming Peter, disarmed every soldier. Again, Tertullian in about 200. Uh, again, he says, Nor is there anything more entirely foreign to us than the affairs of state. Uh, Cyprian in 200 uh, to 258 says the hand must not be spotted with the sword and with blood after uh, the Eucharist has been carried in it. Talking about taking communion. Those who take communion can't participate in the sword. Uh, and then again, Lactantius says, uh, when God forbids us to kill, he not only prohibits us from open violence, which is, not, which is not even allowed by public laws, but he warns us against the commissions of things which are deemed lawful among men. We can't even participate in lawful administration of justice. Thus it will be neither charged lawful for a man to engage in warfare, since his warfare is justice itself. So again, these guys, the early church, took the New Testament to be saying that we can't participate in government, can't participate in the administration of justice, of the law code, of military service, um, and, and all of that sort of thing. And, and obviously this was part of their experience because for 250 years the church was a martyr's church. That's the earliest church. It was because uh, they refused to worship the state or the emperor or participate in that. And uh, they were often charged with uh, atheism and sedition to the Roman state because they weren't a part of it. They wouldn't be part of that society and that government. So that was the opinion of the early church as they understood this, the apostolic church. In a second, we're going to take a look at how that changed and how that change was brought about um, by men like Augustine uh, in the 4th century.